Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. On this episode, we're going to be finishing up our examination of John chapter 4. Um, this is part of our larger study of the entire book, uh, the entire Gospel of John. And in chapter 4, we've been in this chapter for uh, the past three episodes, and uh, we've just finished looking at Jesus' um, ministry uh, to the Samaritans and Sychar, and actually that all began with his interaction and his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. And many of you who are familiar with Scripture might know all about that, but we we went over it uh, on a couple of episodes. And then last episode, um, we looked at Jesus and his, I mean, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about his ministry at with the Samaritans at Sychar because it doesn't go into a lot of detail. We talked about um, you know, their belief now based on the Samaritan woman's testimony and now having heard from Jesus himself. We talked about the harvest and what Jesus was conveying to his disciples when he talks about the harvest and that the fields are, are white for harvest and everything. So we've, we've had a good few weeks of, of good discussion, I feel, um, regarding Jesus's ministry in that area in Samaria. And now, um, if you remember at the beginning of chapter four, it says, you know, Jesus departed to Galilee because, you know, the Pharisees had learned that uh, that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. And so to allay any trouble that would would be untimely at that time, I believe, and plus to keep a divine appointment, Jesus leaves Judea and is on his way to Galilee. So where we pick up now in this episode that trip is now complete. He arrives in Galilee, and now we see him with uh, have an encounter with another person. So it's interesting. We're we're seeing these different interactions with these different people. Um, in chapter three, uh, it was Jesus and Nicodemus. In chapter four, it was it was Jesus uh, Jesus and the uh, Samaritan woman. And now, and I guess still in chapter four, but just. In has um, a bit of a problem, has a big problem actually regarding his son because his son is sick to the point where he's about to die. Um, so when we're talking about miracles and, and healing people and true saving faith, uh, you know, how do those things intersect? I mean, in many people's cases that it might look different just depending on how God works on the heart. But we're going to look at this specific case with this uh, with this um, uh, royal official um, in th at the end of John chapter four, the healing of his son, who uh, again was about to die. Um, and just this whole situation, what this says about Jesus himself, as far as who he is. And again, I think that that is, that is a, a, a theme that we've been seeing, you know, a little bit in chapter three and chapter four, Jesus highlighting who he is, uh, to the people that he's talking to. And so, um, we're going to get into this here. Let me go ahead and read the passage at hand here. We're looking at chapter four. And again, like I said, we're going to finish up chapter four and, and um, we're looking at verses 43 through 54. And so this is what uh, this uh, portion of scripture says. It says after the, um, after the two days he, and after the two, because Jesus had spent two days with the Samaritans um, in Sychar because they asked him to stay. And so he stayed with them two days. So in verse 43, it says after the two days, he departed for Galilee for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday uh, uh, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that, that, uh, knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed 
and all, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. All right. Well, before we go uh, and delve diver, uh, delve diver, delve deeper, <laughs> delve deeper into the text, let me just go ahead and um, uh, let you know that if you enjoy this program and you haven't done so up to this point, um, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts. You can also do so on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. You can also follow me, Steve Gill, on X. My handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S C R I P T S which stands for Loving the Scriptures. And also, if you haven't done so already, I would highly encourage you to order a copy of my book, Signs of the End, What Did Jesus Say About His Own Return, and the Events That Point to It. It's a a study of Jesus' words to his disciples on the Olivet Discourse about the signs of the end of the age, answering the question that the disciples asked him um, regarding that. So Mark 13, uh, uh, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. So as usual, I will go ahead and leave a, a, a link in the episode description uh, so that it'll t- you can click on it. It'll take you to the order page. Um, and I hope you order a copy. I hope you read it. And I hope that you're blessed by it. Okay, so this whole thing with, uh, with, the, with the official that comes from Capernaum, um, again, just to remind you, as I said a few minutes ago, we're dealing with a situation where Jesus was all this time, you know, even from the beginning of chapter four, was on his way back north. Uh, up to Galilee. Remember, he had gone. Uh, he had gone south to to to, 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 to I can't speak today. <laughs> he had gone south to Judea and specifically Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But I think you get the sense that even after the Passover had completed, he had spent some time there because um, you see that he was uh, that he uh, he and his disciples, his disciples specifically. Had been baptizing, uh, had been baptizing people while he was down there, and then when he heard the whole thing about the Pharisees and what they had learned about Jesus's ministry and how he was winning disciples over, he uh, he left uh, Judea and started making his way up to Galilee. Um, so then he had he stopped in uh, Samaria um, near Sychar at Jacob's well, um, where he has that interaction with the Samaritan woman, and then eventually uh, the whole city of Sychar. We went over and talked about all that, like I said, over the last few weeks. We don't need to, uh, you know, re go over a, a lot of those things here. But now we come to the point where Jesus has finally reached his destination. He's, he's come back to Galilee, um, and so as it says there, as we uh, as we just looked at a, a minute ago in reading the passage, it says after the two days he departed for Galilee. Okay, um, and so that's verse for, uh, verse forty three, and that's pretty self explanatory. Now we get into verse 24. In verse 24, we have kind of a parenthetical note here that John that John writes here, which I think is pretty interesting. It's interesting, and if you're looking at it for the first time, it might be it might be interesting but odd because you're wondering what Jesus is is getting at by putting this here. But in verse 44, it says, For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Okay. Now that phrase might sound familiar to you uh and if that sounds familiar to you then that's because it's been it's mentioned in other parts of scripture um as well one example would be um in uh, in um mark chapter was it mark chapter 5 i believe it's uh uh mark chapter 5 um talking about the no excuse me chapter 6 i believe i think i think mark chapter 6 is the right one not chapter 5 chapter 6, uh, which describes uh, Jesus being rejected by the people in his own hometown of Nazareth. Um, and so that was one of the things that it was said there. I think Jesus himself even said that a prophet is without honor um, in his own hometown. Okay. Um, but what, and, and it's, it's interesting because in a situation like that, what you had were, you know, the, the locals in that, in that village 
taking exception to Jesus and saying, where did he get all of these things? Isn't this, isn't this Joseph's son, you know, isn't his, aren't his brothers and his sisters here among us? And it says that he, that they took offense at him. So hearing that phrase of, you know, um, they have, you know, that a prophet is without honor in his own hometown seems to make a lot more sense in that sort of context. But what is he, what is he trying to explain? What is John trying to explain here? Um, when he when he's uh, when he says that now notice in verse 44 he's saying that this is something that Jesus himself had testified to so this isn't so this isn't necessarily I said this is kind of something that John is right and I mean John is writing it but he's writing and relaying what Jesus has testified to in the past um, and saying that uh, that a prophet has no uh, honor in his own hometown um, now we do see a lot of positive things from what we've just seen with the Samaritans OK, um, but now we're going into, you know, like I said, we're going back to Galilee um, and Galilee, um, at, at least with overall, like overall, we might be dealing with something slightly different. But even so, even when you read beyond verse 44, you might wonder what Jesus is getting at here, because it seems like there's a lot of positive reception uh, from the Jews in, uh, in Galilee when Jesus returns. Um, we'll talk about that here in, in, in just a minute. But Here's what I would say about this about this note here uh, that John leaves about Jesus testifying to the fact that a prophet um, has no honor in his own hometown, um, and that is, you know, is that this is something where this might indicate um, that Jesus has his eye on another divine appointment. Uh, that divine appointment being with the uh, with this father who we're going to see here in a minute, who has this sick son, um, and this this official he's called an official. Um, in the passage there, he initially may have represented the shallow uh, faith that existed in Israel. And again, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, too. I'm not just pulling these things out of thin air. I mean, we, we, I think we can draw these things uh, from the text itself. Um, but even if we're talking about going, going back to Galilee and even seeing the welcoming reception that he does get, we do know um, that he does get a little bit of grief um, again, even going back to, you know, his own hometown, um, we see this again, specifically in, in Luke chapter four, um, which, you know, may be a separate incident than what I mentioned earlier from, uh, Mark chapter six, uh, but they're both, but they both take place in Nazareth. And if we look at, if we're looking at something like Luke chapter four, Luke chapter four, if we take all of Jesus's earthly ministry that's recorded in the gospels and we try and piece it together chronologically, Luke chapter four, um, may very well probably comes right after, um, or soon after what we, what we've seen in, uh, uh, chapters two, middle of chapter two, all the way through, uh, uh much of chapter four up to where we are right now. Uh, so in other words, right after this Gal uh, this Judean ministry that we've been seeing in John, Jesus returns to Galilee, and then sometime after there, you you have Luke chapter four. If you're not familiar with Luke chapter four, that's where Jesus goes in. He reads the from uh, the scroll in the synagogue in uh, in his hometown and reads from Isaiah. Um, he says, "Today this uh, scripture is fulfilled in your hearing," and pretty much lays things out as if to suggest that the the promise of life and everything is is for the Gentiles as well, and that really set people off, and they wanted to throw him off a cliff and kill him. Um, so the whole thing of a prophet having no honor his own, in his own hometown isn't mentioned um, in Luke, uh, but you do see that um, in his own hometown, uh, he was rejected to the point that they wanted to throw him off a cliff. So um, that's what we have there. So, um, and by the way, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I got, I, let me stop right here because something just came to mind. And if I, and if I just reserve it for later, I'm going to forget to bring it. I'm, I'm going to forget to bring it up at another time. So while it's come up to my mind, let me just say it now. So I don't forget down the road, but I meant to men I meant to mention earlier that in the last episode, um, I had made mention of, um, the disciples calling fire, uh, asking Jesus, shall we call fire down from heaven to consume these Samaritans? That was when Jesus and his disciples were trying to pass through a Samaritan village and they refused to. And I was trying to wrestle with, I, I had a brain freeze there, um, trying to think of the names of the disciples who had made that specific request. And I think I said, Andrew, 
um, and John, but it's 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 James and John, so the, the the two uh, brothers, James and John, and I that's something that should I should have known at, on the spot there, but like I said, my I had a brain freeze. And I was like uh, uh, Andrew and John, I think, or, or something like that. So I just wanted to set the record straight. It was James and John um, in that passage that uh, that were uh, asking Jesus that question? Okay, so back to our regularly scheduled podcast episode. Um, you know where we see the again that the the rejection of Jesus and and Jesus having no honor his own in his own hometown would prove to be true. And again, like I said, Luke chapter four would be a would be a perfect example of that. But What's interesting and weird here, I mean, weird from a human perspective, I mean, the Holy Spirit put this together and, you know, he knows what he's doing, but um, it has this whole thing. It says for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet had um, has no honor in his own hometown. And then you go into verse 40, uh, verse 45, it says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Okay. And so we're thinking like, wait a minute. Okay, so what's going on here? Because again, this is different from what we would see in in some place like Mark chapter six, where Jesus says a prophet has no honor in his own hometown after, you know, the people in his own hometown were raising a big stink about him in a negative way, obviously. Here we have great reception um, that we're just coming out of in Samaria. And now we're coming into great reception once he comes back to Galilee, because as it says there, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. So it's like, OK, great. So what exactly are we dealing with here? What you know, again, I think what we're dealing with is is Jesus um, uh, having in mind or, or John laying out for his audience the fact that Jesus is about to is, is about to fulfill another divine appointment. And here's the thing that we have to understand here is that. We have, uh, you know, a, a, a statement here that a prophet is without honor in his own hometown, which, by the way, in in the context of John, John isn't talking necessarily about I don't think he's meaning to, to talk about specifically in his own hometown um, in Nazareth. But I, again, I think he's 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 has a broader perspective in mind as it relates to the people of Israel themselves. Um you know, and again, that's that would seem to make sense after coming out of such a great reception um, as it related to the Samaritans. But again, keep in mind um, that even at the very beginning in the book of John, um, you know, it says that he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And then in verse 11, he says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So we're not really seeing anything new here. Um, we're, we're seeing something that is you know, that, you know, we should expect. Um, and as far as the divine appointment is concerned, um, you know, what we're going to see is that even though, um, you know, Jesus is rejected um, in his own hometown um, in a broader sense here in the context of in the context of John, um, is that Jesus in his grace and in his mercy still reaches out to people in need of salvation. And this official with the sick son is an example of that. Now, as it relates to how do we make heads or tails of the of the welcoming reception that Jesus gets in light of the description that John lays out here, as far as uh, no, uh, a prophet having no honor in his own hometown, notice what the rest of the, you know, verse 45 in full says. Let me read all of verse 45 again. It says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Here it is having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Now, you might read that and you might still say, okay, I still don't understand what the big deal is um, and how that connects to, you know, the whole thing of, of Jesus having no honor in his own hometown. Well, here's the thing. This is, this is very much along the same lines of the shallow faith that we talked about at the end of chapter two. Remember that? Remember, if you don't, just go back and read uh, chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Remember, it talked about how while Jesus was at the Passover feast, um, you know, he was doing signs and stuff, and people were believing him because of the signs that he was doing. So Jesus was active in in giving forth signs and everything, and it says that people uh, believed in him. But it also said that Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in man, okay? So in other words... What it, what it was saying is that these people, they may have been wowed by his miracles, but 
that's all they were really interested in. And they weren't really ones who understood him for who he really was. And so, again, you remember we looked at when we went into John chapter three, we saw Nicodemus as kind of a case in point um, of that of that whole thing and how and how that applied to him individually, who kind of represented every everybody else in that category. OK. And in fact, when we're talking about these people in Galilee, because, again, it says that these people had seen um, what Jesus had done. Um, there, uh, for they had heard, um, excuse me, for they, uh, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast for they too had, uh, had gone to the feast. These people, much of many of these people very well could have been the same people that are being described, um, at the end of John chapter two, because it says the, the, these Galileans there, they, they had been to the feast. So it's not surprising then that if they had been at the feast and they had seen Jesus's miracles then they would, then, then many of them very well would fall in that same category of people who, um, you know, where their, where their faith was shallow and it, and it didn't go beyond the miracles, um, and, and extend to the person of Jesus Christ and who he is. Um, and that was the problem that we have there. So, uh, what problem there was in Judea is now the problem that we have in Galilee. Um, and much because a lot of the people in Galilee now that are welcoming, welcoming him are the same people that are described at the end of John chapter two. Okay. But even though you have that as the situation here, we have, um, this official that comes to pay Jesus a visit. Um, and so in verse 46, it says, so, um, you know, first it establishes Jesus where he, where he is. It says, so he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine. Okay. And if you were there for, uh, in our, uh, to listen to our study and, um, when we started John chapter two, you saw that whole thing. We went over that, um, the, the, at the wedding of the wedding at Cana where he, uh, changed water into wine. Um, that was the first Galilean sign that was performed. And the second sign we're now about to witness and we're now about to see. And so in, in verse 46, it continues and says, um, and at Capernaum, there was an official who's, uh, excuse me, at, at, and at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. So here we're introduced to this man. Um, he's called an official here um, in, in, at the end of that verse, uh, an official whose son was ill. Now, the word for official in the original language, in the original Greek there, um, would suggest that this is a royal official. That's why I mentioned, I think I may have even used the term royal official before. Um, the, the word there, the part of the root of that, you know, suggests, you know, having to do with a king. So he was probably somebody who was um, employed in the court of um, Herod Antipas. I mean, if we're talking about Capernaum. Um, and so that's, that's, who, that's, who we're, uh, that's who we're dealing with here. And so he hears about Jesus um, and by the way, he's at Capernaum. Jesus is in Cana. The distance between the two, we're talking about approximately 20 miles. Okay. So this guy in verse 47, it says, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. So, you know, this guy makes the, makes the 20 mile trip after he heard that Jesus had returned to Galilee. And, you know, at this point, you know, we're, we're, what we're dealing with, we're dealing with a man um, who's desperate. He's at the point of desperation because we're not only dealing with a, with a son of his who's just ill. I mean, this is a serious illness because it says there that he is at the point of death. Uh, and any of you who are parents who might, you know, might be able to identify or might be able to just imagine what it would be like if your child was at the point of death and there seemed to be no nothing that doctors or anybody else can do um, and it, it looks very much that he's going to die. I mean, that's 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 a rough thing that uh, that one would have to go through. And uh, so here we are with this man. And so he's very much familiar with what Jesus has done. He's probably among those num uh, that number. So he's heard about Jesus. And so he goes and makes that is willing to make that 20 mile trip. Uh, to Jesus so that he can, so that he can come down, so he can bring him back to Capernaum so that he can heal, uh, so that he can heal his son. Now, Jesus's response here is, is pretty interesting um, in verse 48, because in verse 48, it says, so Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. 
Now, again, that might seem like an odd statement given the given the situation here. OK, now, before we I make any other comments on that, let, let's just be aware uh, that the you here in the in in the in that verse there, unless you see uh, signs and wonders, you will not believe. The you, the both of those yous in 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 those in in that verse is plural. So he's not just talking to the man and the man only. He's talking about the man and everybody else like him. So all these other Galileans and 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 everything. And so, um, you know, it's he's lumped in with that. It's kind of similar to you know Jesus and when he was talking to Nicodemus and and saying that you still do not believe. He was the you there was plural, so he wasn't just talking about Nicodemus, but he was talking about Nicodemus and all the other Jews that he associated with. Um, but here's the thing: even though the man, um, you know, was uh, is coming in desperation, this is, uh, you know, this is probably the state of the man's heart previously and, and even leading up to this point. So in other words, if we minus this, this, this emergency situation with the son, I think the commentary that we have on this man's heart is that this man would have been one who would need to see signs in order to, in order to believe. And that still might be the case of his heart up to this point. The only thing is that now, you know, his focus is on his son and he desperately wants his son, his son to be healed. And he wants Jesus to come and, and heal him. This isn't necessarily something where he's saying, um, if you do this, I'll believe in you. But if you, but if you don't, I won't believe in you. It's not anything where, where this man is explicitly coming out and saying that, but I think it's a matter of his heart condition, um, that that is the case. And so Jesus says this out loud and he says this to the man who's given him a very serious requ- request Hey, come down before my son dies and, and before my son dies. And he says that unless you see you and, you know, he's including the man there and everybody else, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And I think by, by actually saying that Jesus confronts the man um, with, a, with, the, with a serious issue um, and even dare I say even a more serious issue than what is going on with his son. As serious as that situation is, because when we're talking about belief versus unbelief, we're talking about um, we're talking about eternity here. Um, the man may have seen Jesus as somebody who did amazing things and and performed many miracles, but again, that as as far as it goes, and that sort of knowledge and that sort of sentiment doesn't save you. And you can go back to, you know, what what is written in in chapter three of John. Um, in verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So this whole thing of belief and unbelief, obedience and disobedience is, is a serious thing. So Jesus is going to tackle that with this guy, and he's going to use this situation not only to work on the man's heart, but also heal his son at the same time. Okay, so Jesus, by saying what he says, confronts the man on the more serious issue at hand. And I think that perhaps at that point or sometime following that point within that instance, you know, by doing that, Jesus does a divine work. God does a divine work on this particular individual where all of a sudden we see somewhat of a change. And it's an interesting change and, a di- and an interesting reaction from this man, given what he's told a little bit later here. But that's what we have here. It says, unless you see signs uh, and wonders, you will not believe. Um, and so... Here we go with, uh, you know, with what follows here in verse 49. It says, the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Okay, so there's the repeat of the um, of the situation. Come down um, before my uh, before my child uh, uh, before my child dies. Um, now, here's the thing. And let me just make a, a, a another quick observation here. Uh, another quick uh, thing. This is just going to let us in on what we're about to see here. I think what we're what we're dealing with here, and this goes back to even more more so to the reason of why why Jesus said what he said to him um, in the previous verse. Jesus is going to show this official who he is. Okay, again, that th- what Jesus is concerned about here is revealing and manifesting himself for who he really is, which is something that which is something that exceeds what this man himself uh, believes about about Jesus Christ. 
So it, it's something where his uh, his understanding is going to expand and it's going to lead to eternal life for this for this man. Um, just like in Nicodemus, um, you know, Nicodemus saw Jesus as a, a, a teacher come from God, which is true, but he's more than just a good teacher who come from God. And just like the Samaritan woman who identified Jesus eventually as a prophet, which is true, but Jesus is more than just a prophet. And again, Jesus reveals himself as God and as the Messiah. And you see how great of an effect that revelation is. And the same thing here. And this is, and what Jesus is going to do is going to manifest the fact that Jesus is more than just somebody who goes around and, and performs signs and wonders and miracles and things like that. And the way that this situation is mapped out and laid out is going to play in big to communicating that message. Okay. So as it says, as I just read there in, um, um, in verse, uh, in verse 49, the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And then in verse 50, Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. Now it's interesting. The official says to Jesus, come down. But Jesus says, go. So in other words, the, 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 uh, the request from the official, I mean, just as it relates to having Jesus move locations from where he, where he is now to Capernaum, Jesus refuses to do so. And, it's, and when I say he refuses to do so, I'm not saying that Jesus refuses to do so as if he's saying, no, I'm not going to do, you know, that's, that's not what's going on. The official says, come down, but Jesus says, go. Okay, which opens up this door for this man's faith to be tested here, um, or maybe he, we, we might be able to say his his new faith that's beginning to bud here, because I think that there's a good possibility that that Jesus is working a, a, a heart change on this on this particular individual on the scene at the moment here. Now, notice Jesus um, not going down with the official as the official originally requested. Um, again, is with the, is that's part of the purpose. That's part of the situation to, to, to set things up, to show more of who he is. So in other words, he doesn't need to be, he's going to show, he doesn't need to be in the presence of the sick son in order to do this healing in order for this miracle to happen. Now, here's another thing that we can also take note of is that Jesus has virtually no information on who, um, who he's healing. At least we don't get that from the text. Maybe there were some preliminaries that were that were laid forth by the official that's just unrecorded in Scripture. You know, Scripture doesn't have to record every single detail. But as far as what we can see, we have a, a man who whose son is sick. We can we can probably assume that he's desperate and wanting Jesus to come down. Um, he's willing to make that twenty mile trip. Again, remember, there's no cars or buses or anything like that. Um, you know, 20 miles to us, given our technology, doesn't seem, doesn't seem like a big deal, but back then it, it kind of is, um, you know, he's willing to go, the, uh, go those 20 miles to, to go to Jesus and to try and get him to come back. Um, but that's, that's really the extent of the interaction. Now, whether there are other things unrecorded, I, I don't know, but it's just interesting, um, that, you know, from our vantage point. Um, even if there is some information, we might be dealing with a situation where Jesus really doesn't have, have uh, where Jesus has very little information on 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 this son, or even the man himself. So you know you can ask this the question in your mind. I mean, if you're looking at this from a human perspective, how does the right person get healed? Only God knows who the right person is, and we're dealing with a situation where a healing is going to happen from a distance right? It's kind of weird. I don't know how well of a, of a, of a example this would be. I was kind of thinking about this as I was, as I was preparing for this, just to kind of give us an indication of what we're dealing with as far as that goes. And I was thinking, and for this example, you have to assume that you're living in the past, i.e., you know, in the seventies or in the eighties or something, um, where you call somebody and you're trying, let's say you're trying to sell them something. And the reason why I say this has to take place in the seventies or the eighties is because nowadays, you know, you can, you know, a caller ID and all sorts of things. We can easily identify who's calling us, um, at home or on our cell phones and that sort of thing. Didn't have those sorts of things, uh, back, uh, back in the olden days, <laughs> you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, um, 
yeah, I mean, maybe some police departments may have had some tracing uh, abilities and stuff within their line of work. But if we're just talking about a regular residence, um, you know, that sort of thing didn't exist yet. The, you know, the phone rings and you have no idea who it is. So let's say that I'm in the 80s, early 80s, and I'm talking to somebody um, and I'm giving them a sales pitch. Just some random person. I don't even tell them who I am, who I work for. I know this is kind of unrealistic, but just go with me just for the sake of the example. And then I said, this is what I have to offer you. I'll give you some time to think about it. And I want you to call me back with the decision of whether or not you decide to buy the product or not. Goodbye. Click. And then I hang up the phone. Now, what's the problem there? The problem is, is I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give him my phone number and he has no name. So he can't look me up in the phone book and he doesn't have a number. And remember, there's no caller ID or anything like that. So I've just called him and assuming that I don't call him back, this guy from a human perspective has absolutely zero way of getting back to me. But then my phone rings, I pick it up and it's him with his decision on what he, what, on what he wants to do. Now, somebody like me or anybody else who would hear a situation like that would be like, how did he know what number to dial? What, what, how did he know who to call? Cause you didn't leave a number, that sort of thing but yet he knew the exact number. And I know, like I said, that might not be a perfect illustration, but what I'm trying to get across here is that if we're dealing with somebody with, in the person of Jesus Christ who really doesn't know or doesn't, isn't given much information, at least from what we can see, again, there might be a possibility, I don't know. But even so, I think we're, you know, we're dealing with something amazing here because again, this is a miracle that's going to happen from afar. So, you know, how do we know that you know, the right person is going to get healed. How does he know who needs to be healed? I mean, we have this father here telling him, telling him my son is, is, is sick and he's on at the point of death. If he goes with this man, as this man is trying to get him to do, this man can t- lead him into his house. Jesus can kneel by the bedside and say, you know, I, you know, I make you well, you know, whatever words he might say or something like that. But that's, that's not really what we're dealing with here. We're just dealing with, you know, a, 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 something from a distance and what, from what seems to be very little information. How does he know what to do? Well, we, we're going to see that he knows exactly what to do because he's God. Only God can do what he's about to do here. Okay. And so what's also interesting. So again, the official said to him, sir, come down before my, uh, come down before my child dies. Uh, Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. That's all he says. Go, your son will live. Now, Jesus' words here do not seem to convey any sort of healing, even though a healing did happen, that a healing does happen. But it's not, it's not, we're not dealing with something where Jesus says, go, I have healed your son or go, your son is healed or anything like that. He just says, your son will live. Okay. As if to say, ah, don't worry. You know, he's going to, he's going to be okay. And that's it. Nothing as far as I will do this for him or this is going, I will cause this sort of thing to happen to him so that his, his healing will be complete or anything like that. He just says, go. So again, that's opposite of the man saying, come, Jesus says, go, your son will live. Now you think about, you know, similar situation by similar, I'm talking about miracles from afar that are done from afar. And you might think of uh, something like uh, the centurion um, who had a sick servant. Um, and you think of places like Matthew again, and the difference in this situation is that the centurion had a good understanding of who he was dealing with. And Jesus, it was Jesus's idea to say, I will come and heal him. And, and the centurion says, you're not, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. Just say the word. I know how this authority thing works um, and that sort of thing. So Jesus didn't have to be in that in the presence of the sick servant in order for the healing to take place. The centurion knew and understand and understood that. But even Jesus's words, and I'm looking at Matthew chapter eight, verse 13, it said, you know, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. I mean, it's still not, uh, your, your servant is healed or, uh, um, I have done, uh, you know, or, or, you know, that sort of thing, or I've healed your servant or something like that. But you can see from the words themselves that something had been done because that was what was requested. And Jesus says, let it be done for you. Somebody's doing something for you. And obviously that's Jesus himself in doing this healing. Let it be done for you as you have believed. Okay. But here in John chapter four, 
we don't get that. We just says, go, your son will live. And that's it. So we're left with a statement here that, I mean, from a human perspective, we might think, well, okay, well, what does that mean though? You know, and I mean, are you going to do something or are you, or are you just making some sort of prediction or something like that? You know, what, what, what exactly is going on here? Okay. Now we do see the man's faith come forth here because it says right after he says that this is the middle of verse 50. It says the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And this is why I say that, you know, what we might be dealing with here is a, as a divine changing of this man's heart. And especially after being confronted with the whole thing of, uh, you know, the whole thing of saying, unless you believe uh, you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And now we have Jesus saying, go, your son will live. And it says that the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went on his way. I mean, that's it. There you go. And you think that given the urgency of the request, this man's faith really shows itself in full bloom. So he took Jesus at his word on the future state of his son. Um, you know, even though the last time this father saw his son, the son was very close to the point of death. We might, you know, somebody might put themselves in that situation and they say, you know, they're saying to Jesus, come down before my child dies. And, the, and Jesus says, your son will live. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You, no, I just saw him. He's going to die. I, I, I've i seen the condition of him. You have to come down. You don't have the full information. I was just with him. He's going to die, that sort of thing. You know, just being told your son will live for, for some people might be an inadequate response from Jesus, especially given such a desperate situation. But instead of, of, of you know, really doubling down in any sort of unbelief, the man took Jesus at his word. And I think that that's truly amazing. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Okay. And so there you have a radical reversal in this whole thing of, of belief. And he hadn't seen anything new as far as miraculous signs or anything like that. He just said, okay. And he just turned around and he went away. Now he will be exposed to the, to the outcome of this miracle because his son will, will have been healed and everything. But you know, there you have it. He believes now he went on his way, as it says there. And then in verse 51, it says, uh, as he was going down, his servants met him um, and told him that his son was recovering. So that's that's really a that's really a a, a, a great thing here. Um, so he meets he he runs into his servants on the way as he's as he's on his way back. And the fact that on his way back to his home, um, his servants met him as he was going down. Um, really, I think indicates something very significant there as well. I think this indicates that the miracle was so amazing that his servants, this official servants had to go and, and go and find and try and find him somewhere on this 20 mile journey. Maybe they hoped that they would run into him, which they did. But I mean, like there wasn't a whole thing of, we'll just wait for him to come back. Now, maybe it wasn't amazing. Maybe it was a whole thing of his son is recovering in such an amazing and radical way. And so maybe we can we could go down there and, and tell uh, our, our, our master that, you know, he doesn't need to bother Jesus anymore. You know, everything's all good and everything like that. But whatever the case is, that would seem to indicate that the ra that the that the miracle was such on, on such a high level. Because it wasn't just a matter of, oh, he's gotten a little bit better and, you know, but he's still, you know, just kind of in this questionable area. It was to the point where they realized that he was pretty much out of the woods. And I would tend to think that this is more of a, an amazement sort of reaction from the servants. And they're saying and they're in such amazement that they're going, they themselves, instead of waiting for their, for their master to come back, they said, we got to find him and they got to, and they, and they go and they, and they try and meet him. Turns out that the master is on his way back and they meet each other. Um, and it says, as he was going down, this is verse 51, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. Okay. So the healing was taking place. It sounds like, sounds like he was getting better. It doesn't sound like it was a, it was an instantaneous sort of thing. But again, like I said, the implications from this is that the progress that was made was such, was to such a radical degree that, I mean, that would defy anything 
um, that would happen on the on the human level. Okay, is is kind of the is kind of the you know the impression at least that I get when I when I look at uh, when I look at this um, when I look at this uh, passage, and so you know the the father's curiosity is piqued. You know, so in verse fifty two, he says, so he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Okay, so the in the afternoon. Um, 1 p.m. You know, is, is when he is when he started recovering, and so as verse uh, as verse 53 says, the father knew that uh, knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, "Your son will live." So this was something where the man now puts two and two together, and he sees that at the moment that he was having this conversation, at the moment that Jesus said, "Your son will live," this wasn't just some sort of wild prediction or anything like that. But it was it was something that Jesus could declare because Jesus was the one who actually did the healing, and it was a healing that happened from afar. Okay, and so you know that's that's so that's totally an amazing thing. So the fact that the son's recovery happened from afar. And at the moment when Jesus had, had spoken to uh, spoken this to him, saying that your son will live, that changes the game completely, I think, in this man's mind. So that while he was in the company of all the other Galileans who may have just been drawn to his miracles and really didn't give much thought to who they were dealing with, and there, therefore he had somewhat of a shallow faith, now we're going to see something where something totally changes. The game has totally changed. Okay, this highlights, at least it should, and I think this did, um, ultimately for this man, this highlights all the more that Jesus is God. So man's perspective on who Jesus is now changes. This this man's uh, perspective now changes. Okay, this was a this was a divine healing, you know, not simply not simply a a, a prediction of, of of some sort. Okay. And so what do we see as a result of this? Now that the man has put two and two together, um, last part of verse 53, it says, and he himself believed that he, that the father, he himself believed in all his household. There you go. And by believed here, there's a difference, I think, between the belief here and the belief that we saw a couple of verses ago when he believed what Jesus had spoken to him and went on his way. Um, here in verse 53, we're talking about a, uh, I believe we're talking about a saving faith, a true saving belief in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. So this is something that where the faith in, uh, before that we saw grew and kind of, and ended up maturing into something that was a true saving faith. And here it says that the man and his household believed, which is something that we see later on a few places in the book of Acts as well. Um, we see it with the Philippian jailer. We see it with Lydia and her household. Um, and I believe we also see it with the centurion in his household. But I mean, you have the man and you have his household who now believe. And, you know, we see something similar here to what we just saw with the Samaritan woman, because, you know, just as a Samaritan woman was shown who Jesus was. And she believed and then reached out to the village. So now we see with this official, this official, by how everything worked out and was divinely unfolded here for this man, just how this official was now shown and even in a grander scale who Jesus Christ was in his manifestation of himself, um, he believed himself. And re, uh, the implication is, I think, he reached out to his household and his household now believes. So, you know, the woman in Samaria started with herself and then she went out and told the village, here we have this official and now he reaches out to the household. And so we have this this whole thing here, the whole household believing. And what a wonderful thing where we have a whole household. And, um, you know, I, I would say that that's, you know, even though a lot of times when it comes to the salvation of one individual, it can cause disruption and, um, and, uh, and certain negative things within a household, which is something that Jesus himself warned about. You know, it did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Um, it's also just as true that God in certain situations, according to his sovereignty and according to his grace, can save an entire household. I've actually seen um, on one or two occasions where, you know, it, not firsthand, but I mean, just with the testimony of people who were introducing me to, to people that they've been sharing with, 
how their whole household uh, came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just think that that's absolutely wonderful and absolutely awesome here. But it's what we have is everything coming into play here divinely and by God's divine plan and by God's divine will, um, you know, p- bringing all of these things together so that he manifests himself all the more to who uh, to this official on who he is. And then when this official sees that Jesus is one who is able to heal from afar, he's like, oh, I'm dealing with somebody far greater than what I've actually been given credit for as far as this whole thing, because he was a part of everybody who had that shallow faith. And, you know, and, you know, we say divine appointment. I At least I said divine appointment or anything. But I mean, he, even there, you know, the, the a difference between this situation of the Samaritan woman is that, you know, Jesus went to the place where he expected to run into the Samaritan woman. Uh, we don't have that here, but it's no less a, a divine plan than what we saw in the earlier part of John chapter four, because God knows how things are going to turn out. He knows that this man is going to come and seek him out and everything is set in place for Jesus uh, to do what he does, which ultimately leads to this whole thing of this man and his household coming to true saving faith. And so this is, as it says here in, uh, in verse 54, this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. And that last part there, verse 54, I think is important because Again, we have to understand that Jesus has been doing signs before in Judea, so he's been doing more than one sign. But when it's talking about the second sign, it's, it's talking about the second sign in Galilee. And even here, we're talking about even the same place in Cana, um, you know, because that's where the first sign in Galilee had happened in Cana, where he changed the water and the wine um, at that wedding. Uh, but here we, it, but just like in the first sign, the first sign we had. Jesus, we had Jesus changing the water into wine. Um, and then in chapter two, verse 11, it says his disciples believed in him. So there was a faith there, a faith statement there. I don't think it was necessarily something where it was true saving faith, but I think it was a confirming faith that solidified the faith that was already there. Um, but just how you, as you have some faith statement there after the first sign here in the second sign, there's a level of belief described in verse, uh, in verse 53 where the man himself believed in all his household. So here, all of this, uh, we see the work of God at play here. And it can involve certain signs and miracles. Um, You know, yes, some people really, you know, looked at signs and miracles and only focused on that. And it was really to the detriment of other people. But there was, there's something to be said about, signs and wonders being used by Jesus himself as a draw to draw people into salvation in a way that in, in a, in a way that he pleases, as we see here um, at the end of, at the end of John chapter four, but he's also able to bring people to faith without any sort of out and out miracle. Now, you, you know, for example, with the Samaritans, I mean, it, nobody was, was healed or raised from the dead. I will say though, that there is a sign uh, to a certain extent because Jesus was able to tell the woman, what her history was without even, you know, having met her, that told her something. But these situations look different and it's all according to God's plan and God's path and how he lays things out. And so here we see Jesus working out salvation for these people so that when they, when time comes, there's true, authentic, saving faith that happens, which I believe is the gift of God. Um, and, uh, and you have salvation taking place. And what a wonderful, wonderful thing. It just reminds us all the more of the sovereignty, the sovereignty of God um, and, and everything like that. Now, we're going to put a bow on that on this for now. We've finished chapter four, but we're get, obviously we're, we're about to venture into John chapter five. And in John chapter five, we're going to see another healing. This one is, is, a, is a man who's lame. He's not able to walk and Jesus is going to heal him. Now, as, you know, rather than, you know, the whole thing of you have a healing and then belief and then, you know, other people coming to faith, we have opposition and people wanting to kill Jesus. Um, and so, like I said, this is going to be something, you know, when Jesus was escape, uh, not escaping, but was going away from Gal, uh, from Judea before, we weren't saying this was because he was a coward and trying to escape or anything like that. And I said that he would come upon opposition in Judea, and we're going to see it in chapter five. We're also going to see it connected to this this miracle 
that we're going to see in chapter five, a long discourse, um, which is also something we're going to see a couple other places in John. We're going to see it in John chapter six. We're going to see it in chapter nine and 10 and that sort of thing. And, you know, Jesus is really going to lay things out for us and for his original audience, the people that he's speaking to, which talks all the more about who he is. So we're going to be exposed to some very interesting things. I hope you come back. Um, and, and, and tune in for those examinations because I think they're going to be very, very profitable for all of us as we explore those passages, okay? So we serve a great and wonderful God and Savior in Jesus Christ, and we just, we just in awe not only of his power but also of his grace and his mercy um, you know, as he extends himself, even to somebody who, let's be honest, was one who was in the category of people who had a shallow faith just like everybody else. And, you know, this was one of, you know, among the people where it was described at the end of John chapter two, that Jesus didn't entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he knew what was in man. So he didn't need testimony about what was in man. Jesus knew what was in this man. He knew that he had a great need. And and in, in sovereignty, he met him even in his state of unbelief. And I believe that there was a divine work in his heart where he was changed. And we see what we see at the end of John chapter four. What a, what a story of not only power, but of mercy and grace from Jesus Christ himself. Okay. So we're going to see a lot of other great things as we, as we continue on in our study of the book of John. But like I said, we'll leave it there for now. If you enjoy this program and you haven't done so already, again, I'll, uh, I'll remind you to go ahead and subscribe to my show. You can do it on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or Spotify. Um, and follow me on Twitter. My handle is at LT Scripps, or did I say Twitter? I think I said Twitter. I meant X. <laughs> I still think of it. It's still Twitter to me, although I am getting a little bit more used to saying X. But you can follow me on X. The handle is the handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. And don't forget to order a copy of my book if you haven't done so already. Signs of the End. What did Jesus say about his own return and the events that point to it? All right, friends. Well, I had a great time examining Scripture with all of you. We're start, we're making our way um, steadily through the Book of John. Like I said, a lot of great things coming up that I'm excited to share uh, uh, share um, with you about. My name is Steve Gill, and I will see you right back here next time. Bye now.